Hello and welcome to the Life is Story podcast. I'm Josh Olds, and I want you to know, folks, that I found her. I did it. Uh, she's been in hiding, I think, for the past few years, but I tracked her down, and today on the podcast, we have the author of The Tales of Goldstone Wood and, and some other books that we'll talk about, uh, Anne Elizabeth Stengel. So, uh, Anne Elizabeth, welcome to the program. Thanks, Josh. I'm happy to be here. Uh, now, I... I, I want to start and just kind of give our give my readers an idea of, of why we're talking today. Uh, Tales of Goldstone Wood was published, and you can correct me here. I think between 2010 and 2015, uh, you yep, had that's right. you had seven full length novels, three novellas. Um, I was first introduced to this series, I think, in 2014 or maybe 13 with Dragon Witch, which was book five, and absolutely loved it, immediately went out oh, and and bought the first four books, kind of followed in lockstep through um, book six, seven, and the novellas. I actually honestly wasn't aware of the last, uh, the last two novellas, um, so they're on mm-hmm. their way. I went and bought them on Amazon uh, yesterday. Because I, I realized that I needed to make sure that I had every single word you ever wrote oh. uh, within this within this uh, this universe that you had created, uh, and then uh, you just didn't. Um, it, it was time for that to end, and, and you ended up starting a new thing, and you just kind of disappeared for a while, and yeah. I, I I had disappeared for a while as well because uh, life is story had become this big thing and I, I just no longer had time for it. I had a young, I was, had a young family, um, and kind of stepped away for a couple of years and now I'm coming back to it and I'm going to the website through all of the old, uh, reviews that I had done mm. and came across, uh, the reviews I'd written for your books. And, uh, I had just moved recently. So I had, I had, packed your books away and I thought, you know, I, I really had a good time with this series for the, for the, you know, amount of time that I was reading it. I, I wonder what she's done recently. So I, 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 I looked you up and you were gone. Um, <laughs> so I asked around a little bit and I, I tracked down your alter ego and I realized I still had your email address. So I sent you an, an email and said, uh, would you want to talk about this? And you were so gracious that I think it's been like less than 24 hours later uh, from the email. Here we are. Uh, we made it work. And uh, I wanted to share with my listeners, old and new, uh, not only Tales of Goldstone Wood, but also your new persona, uh, your new books as well. So with that big introduction, uh, let's start kind of at the beginning and just work our way through chronologically. Uh, can okay. you give me a history of Tales of Goldstone Wood and how it jump started your writing career? Sure. Um, well, like most writing histories, it's actually fairly complex, but um, I will try to bullet point this as best I can. Um, so I had, when I was quite young, I was still a teenager, I had this idea for uh, a complex world um, with like many facets and like layers of reality, and I, I wanted to write this uh, fantasy series where I could basically jump in and out of it at any point in time and write complete standalone stories, but with threads of connection throughout history. And it was just going to be this super vast, complex thing. Um, and I was super passionate about it, and totally. Uh, unable to write anything like that at the time. My skills were not up to that that kind of concept. Uh, concept. But um, fast forward a couple of years and, um, you know, a couple of years spent studying English lit and really immersing myself in great literature and some of the, you know, the great minds of, you know, all ages. And um, I actually got an idea for a much, much simpler story, which was Heartless. Mm-hmm. And that simplicity was exactly what I needed. I had been playing with these huge ideas that were so far beyond me. And then I had this little simple jewel of a concept. And so I wrote my heart out with this 
super, super simple story. And somehow that combination of passion, simplicity, combined with, you know, hints of this more complex world that I wanted to write, um, ended up being something kind of special. Um, and, you know, I, I just loved that story at the time. I haven't read it in years. Um, it might be terrible. I don't know. <laughs> but I loved it at the time. And, um, and uh, other people did, too. I actually I started querying for an agent um, a year after I wrote it, um, got the first agent I queried. She started querying publishing houses and got the first publishing house she queried. Um, I signed a contract, and um, by 2010, uh, I had my first published book in my hand. That was almost exactly 10 years ago. Uh, that was mm. July 10th, July 10th, 10 years ago. And, um, yeah, so I became a professional novelist at quite an early age. Um, I was 24 by the time I had the first book, and um, I thought that meant I had a head start on success as a novelist. What it actually meant was I had a head start on all the pitfalls of a novelist and uh, the world of publishing. Um, I could start very young learning how to do all the wrong things and do them with gusto. But I learned a lot in the process. So it was a head start in its own way. Yeah, for sure. I, I You know, you say that Heartless might be terrible, but it it did win the Christie Award for debut fiction. So I don't it, know... It, it, Give it that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think it was it was it was too terrible. Uh, and and you had this success. You, you very young uh, in terms mm-hmm. of a normal author um, uh, in in the industry, and you won a, a Christie Award for debut fiction for Heartless, mm-hmm. and then you pretty much ran the table in the visionary category in the Christie Awards in the years after. Um, at very least being on the short list, I think, for, for most of those mm-hmm. years. Um, wh- what was what was your writing life like at that time? Uh, where did you think the series was going to go? Uh, well, you know, success is a funny word. Um, what looks like success from the outside might be an absolute disaster from the inside. Um, so I vividly remember the night of that first awards banquet, that, that debut win. Um, and, you know, they called my name and I, I went up and received my award and gave a little speech and I was just incandescent mm. with excitement. Mm. And then um, the head of the agency where I was at the time says to me, uh, it's a shame you've peaked so young. It's only going to be downhill from there. And I was, naturally a little bit enraged by this and was like, no, obviously not. I haven't mm-hmm. peaked. Like I'm just getting started. And I even said that to her and I, you know, I said it was a laugh, but I felt very angry. Like what a thing to say. Um, a year later, uh, I'm sitting at another awards banquet and this was minutes before they called my name and I went up to receive the award for my second book. Um, big glamorous night, all the people are out there, all the, all the big names in the business. And um, I'm sitting at a table with people from my publishing house. And one of them leaned over and told me that my sales were so bad, I probably wouldn't get another contract. And a few minutes later, I go up to receive my next award. So yeah, my actual writing life beneath the surface was one of extreme stress and a desperate need to prove the industry wrong, to prove that I hadn't peaked and that I I did have something to offer the market, that I could actually get those sales um, and that I did have a future in publishing. Uh, But the thing is, um, awards and critical acclaim and even an absolutely diehard and devoted fan base, which I had. I mean, I had this wonderful fan base of people who just – adored my work. I mean, I can't even tell you how much fan art, fan fiction, all, all of this, this passion that I got from my fan base, and none of that equaled sales. Mm-hmm. And this is ultimately a business. If the sales aren't there, it's bad for business. So I had thought at the time that I'd be able to keep writing books in this series for the rest of my career. I, I thought I was carving out a new and exciting niche for Christian fantasy, I thought the genre was going to explode and I was going to be right there in the center of it all. And I was absolutely wrong. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting to, because I, because I really feel like a a lot of people who aren't in the industry just assume, well, if your if your book wins an award, it must be 
It must be selling. Mm, like it the, must be selling. It must be selling. It, it, you know, it must be. Obviously, it's good. Um, why? Why do you feel like there's not always this? And I, I'm putting you on the spot here. Um, <laughs> why there's not always this connection between critical acclaim and good sales? Well, I mean, the truth is. Critics are looking for one thing, and um, in all honesty, they're looking for a lot of the same things that I was looking for at that time. You know, I'm coming from um, a college background, an English lit background. Um, you know, I, I'm passionate about you know themes and you know uh, just beautiful writing and you know beautiful prose and developed characters and and all of these things that critics are going to be you know really passionate about as well. Um, readers are looking for a good time and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Like that, that is, that is why we write. That's why re- writers have written throughout the ages. Dickens was a popular novelist. He wasn't, he wasn't mm-hmm. looking to write classics. He was looking to entertain his audience. Um, but there is a major disconnect there sometimes with, with both writers and critics and the audience. The audience wants, they want the, the thing that they have enjoyed in previous books, they want that taste, they want that flavor, they want that excitement, and they want to enjoy themselves. And enjoyment can mean a lot of different things depending on which genre you're in and what, what your personal taste as a reader are, et cetera. But ultimately, that's what readers are going for. They are looking to be entertained and they are looking to have a good time when they sit down and they take a break from the stresses of day-to-day life and they're, gonna, they're going to escape to another world. And that's not the same thing as a, as a literary critic um, or a judge for a contest or, you know, a young ingenue novelist <laughs> wanting to <laughs> reshape a niche in, in fantasy. Uh, they're, they're just very different things. They're very different mindsets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can tell you from someone who I, 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 I like to hope that I bridge both worlds because I don't really consider myself a literary critic, uh, but I have judged in, in those award uh, contest both mm-hmm. the, both the Christies and the Inspies, and uh, you know I found um, your work in, in in particular, and I won't say whether or not I specifically judge any of your work, um, but just 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 <laughs> to kind of give a background on that I have kind of judged in that world while also having a knowledge of your books, um, mm-hmm. the you know. It, I mean, let's be honest. Your books aren't boring. Um, well, thank you. I, you know, I, <laughs> I I found them very engaging, very interesting. You also obviously had this very loyal fan base um, that was in, very invested in in the world. Uh, it's it's just I find it I just find it so incredible um, to be like you can you can really you can really have everything in terms of a a devoted fan base you can have uh all the critical acclaim and this is just a difficult industry uh, this, is just, mm-hmm. this is just a it hard really a hard industry because what you know what else what else are you, are you going to do and um mm-hmm. you know you you've done your job as the author in putting out quality entertaining fiction uh, and, and it maybe even that the publisher, um, Bethany House was the, was the publisher that they may have mm-hmm. done everything they could have done to have, to have sold these books and, and got them in front of the people that they need to be in front of. And it's just, it's just difficult. It's just very, very hard. Uh, and I say that not to discourage anyone who is a, a wannabe writer or author, uh, but just to kind of say, okay, hey, not. you know, this is yeah. this is the this, this is the way the industry goes. Uh, and, and also, if you have an author that you like, uh, support that author, <laughs> you know, go, Amen. support that author because they um, you know, get the, get their books in libraries for sure. But also go out and, and buy all their books and, and put your money um, where your heart is to support good quality fiction because authors can be doing everything right and still it still be a struggle um so you get to you you did get all the way to book six so i don't, I don't know how long your first mm-hmm. contract was uh but you did you did manage six books and after book six uh shadow hand then you moved away from traditional publishing 
Uh, you moved away from Bethany House and you began Wood Press. And I've already got an idea of the answer, but I have to ask what precipitated <laughs> that, that change. Yes, well, uh, you probably guessed it. I didn't get the next contract. It really was just that simple. My my series didn't sell well enough, and uh, they had to let me go. Um, my I, I give my the the people I directly worked with my my editors. They're my acquisitions editor in particular was just fantastic, and he campaigned so hard for me. Uh, David Long was his name, and he was awesome. Um, and he really campaigned. He tried to really present to the the, the publishing house uh, that there were other values to keeping me on than just those initial numbers. And my dear fans, they, they did a letter writing campaign. I mean, they, they went all out. They really tried and the numbers just weren't there. So, um, so yeah, they had to let me go. Um, so I still had all of these stories uh, that I wanted to tell and, uh, and a devoted fan base, you know, so hungry for more, uh, all of these threads that hadn't been resolved. And, um, my agent went around to a couple different publishing houses, knocking on doors, trying to see if anyone was interested in picking me up. But again, you know, publishing houses are happy to see, oh, pretty shiny awards, but oh, the numbers aren't there. So we, we could not garner any interest. Um, and at that point in 2010, um, indie publishing was really starting to get rolling as a legitimate way to make a career in the writing world. Um, so I thought, hey, you know what? I've got the audience. I've got the writing chops. I've got connections with talented editors. I can figure out some of these other, you know, elements involved. Um, surely I can find cover designers and learn how to format and all of that stuff. Let's, you know, let's let's see what I can do with indie publishing. Um, so that's how Rugalwood Press, my little independent house, was born. Um, it was uh, primarily intended for uh, launching and creating my own work. Uh, but I also used it as, a, as an opportunity to uh, publish some other small small works um, by various talented people that I worked with. Um, and it was a great experiment. I learned so, so much mm-hmm. about um, about indie publishing through that venture. Um, Rugalwood Press is no more at this stage. Um, I finally closed down shop on that on that particular venture. Mm, I guess a year ago now. I want to say it was about a year. so it was it was up until very recently I was still running Rugalwood. Um, but yeah, it was ultimately, I, I just wanted to see if there was a way that I could continue giving my fan base, uh, what they loved. Mm-hmm. And that, that lasted for book seven, uh, Golden mm-hmm. Daughter. And you also wrote some novellas. And I, I, I think that maybe all the novellas were afterward, or there may have been one before Golden Daughter and then a couple mm-hmm. uh, after. I did a goddess tithe I wrote before Golden Daughter because okay. that was my, like, I want to see how this goes before I try to do a large-scale mm-hmm. novel. So I wrote short little goddess tithe and learned how to find a cover designer, how to format, how to publish on all the different platforms, um, all of that and with just that little tiny book before launching into, you know, a massive novel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and then you, you did Golden Daughter, you did some other, some other short works. And then I think... Um, mm-hmm. You actually went back and serialized Golden Daughter, as well. I did. I tried that. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. I did. Just, so you're you're just really exploring indie publishing, and what the opportunities are, what the market is like, what do people want, and then you just stepped away entirely. Uh, how hard was it to leave Tales of Goldstone Wood? Yeah, it 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 was truly devastating. I mean it. Um, this is the first time I've talked about it uh, in a public setting, and it's still honestly very hard for me. Like I'm tearing up a little bit talking about it now. I'm I'm in a much better place than I was at the time. But the truth is, it was it was devastating. Um, I loved those stories. You know, I loved that world. Sorry, I'm tearing up a little bit. Okay. I'm gonna get my act together here. <laughs> um, it 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 was very very hard, um, and I clung to it for a very long time. I really wanted to keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, after publishing Golden Daughter, I started writing the next novel, Poison Crown, um, which I still get letters from my fans asking when that one's coming out. And I wrote, I want to say, three or four different versions of that book, um, and I clung to it so hard. And I could, I could feel, I could feel God telling me it was time to let go, mm-hmm. and I did not want to. Yeah. 
Um, but, but ultimately there was, I could not, I could not find a way to pull that book together. I really couldn't. And some of the reasons were honestly very practical. Um, like looking at, looking at the market, looking at my own sales numbers coming in, looking at what I was managing to do with Golden Daughter. Um, I was realizing that insofar as actually having a career, actually making a living doing this, actually contributing financially to the needs of my family, um, I could not make money off of books that I did not own the first six books in the series. Mm-hmm. Um, I could I could not market book seven when I couldn't market books one through six. And my publishing house at that point, obviously they you know they kind of seen the end of what they could do with my work. So they, their interest in promoting that series was basically non-existent. Uh, they hold on to the rights. And um, and as far as I can tell, we've queried about getting rights back, but um, they're not interested in, in giving the rights back. Um, and and that's totally their right. Like there's there's absolutely nothing wrong or illegal about that choice at all. Like they are absolutely within their rights to hold on to those books. But the truth is, um, if they're holding on to the books and not marketing them, I I can't keep trying to sell and promote books seven, eight, nine, ten in a series. Um, so that's why I tried I tried breaking Golden Daughter off and turning it into a serial and trying to make it more of a standalone product. Um, you know, experimented with some other ideas. I had another novel set within the world that that I separated from Goldstone Wood, um, the a branch of silver, a branch of gold. You may have seen that one floating mm-hmm. around. Um, to see if I could maybe try doing something like that. Like keep my world but make a different series, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um yeah, but ultimately, I I started to realize the writing was on the wall. This was not where I was supposed to be. And when I, especially when I could not write a story that I thought I was passionate about, I started to realize that this is not just, this is not just practically wrong. This is truly not where God wants me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was hard. It was very hard. It's still hard in, in many ways. Um, I get fan mail regularly still, um, not as often as I used to, but I get fan mail regularly from readers who just don't understand and they, they want to know, they want to know why and they want, they want to know, um, how I could stop doing something that at the time I was so passionate about and that obviously I was, I was writing for the glory of God and it had a blessing on other people and how could that possibly be the wrong thing for me to do now? And, I mean, I've gotten to the point now where I, I usually don't even answer the emails because I, I, I can't explain, which is why I'm glad to have this opportunity um, in a more public setting to actually talk about it and, you know, hopefully put some of those questions to rest. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was devastatingly hard, but ultimately I have to believe that it was, it was God telling me, no, it's, it's time to redirect. It's time to go in a different direction completely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's so hard, I think, especially with this series, because number one, it's it's what you started out with. So mm-hmm. you know, this isn't this isn't just a series that you've enjoyed writing. This has been your writing career. So it mm-hmm. almost seems you know to step away from this isn't to step away from one of the many worlds you've created or one of the many series you've written. This is to step away from everything you've done up to yeah. this point, and it, to step away from something that is like you successful in in yeah. you know a certain term it wasn't these books were not abject failures they had um mm-hmm. an audience they had a critical acclaim they just did not have enough sales um mm-hmm. so that's you know and that's that's it's so difficult and i think the other thing that made it diff- difficult is you really could have written in this world forever uh it's such I a yeah. such a vast such a vast uh, universe that you had created a backstory of and the way that you can just jump into the timeline at any point and be like, Oh, here's, here's a story, um, you know, made it so that, you know, there wasn't going to be a natural end to tales Mm -hmm. of Goldstone wood. Uh, so there's probably always going to come a point where you are going to say, okay, I want to do something different and this just sort of forced you into it. Um, yeah. So you get to that point, you make that decision, and you just start from scratch. Like a new name, mm-hmm. a, a pen name that you did not tell anyone about for a long time. And like you said, you, you've not really talked about it publicly until here. 
but mm-hmm. you, you 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 kept writing. So what was your like? Why why just start over? Not just in 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 your series, but like with your whole writing persona. Why 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 start from the beginning again? Uh, well, a number of reasons. Um, that's actually a it's a very interesting question. Um, there's a lot of different layers to it. Uh, for one thing, um, honestly, my passionate fan base. Um, they, I could tell they would really struggle with following me outside of Goldstone Wood. It's not that they wouldn't want to support me, but it would be very, very hard for them, especially just initially, to, to leave Goldstone Wood alone when there was so much unfinished story. So there there was that element of, okay, they, they want more of this product that I have been giving them and have trained them to expect from me, and I can't give them that anymore, so I need to take more of a break. Um, the other reason, honestly, is, is very, very practical. Um, so keeping in mind that these books were not successful books, they did not sell well. Um, so the primary seller of books in the world is Amazon.com. Mm-hmm. And uh, Amazon is amazing at selling books to readers because Amazon has algorithms that target what each individual buyer is interested in. So, for instance, if you go in and you buy um, a Christian fantasy, it triggers an algorithm that makes them go, oh, this buyer likes Christian fantasy, and they will start showing you and advertising to you more Christian fantasy. Um, And as that continues to develop, like you'll start receiving emails from them in your promotions folders, and you'll see ads showing up on the sidebars. I mean, you could be just looking to go buy some air filters for your house and you'll still see ads for Christian fantasy on the side. I mean, like they are number one in figuring out what their buyers want and then pushing it to them. And uh, I realized after doing a decent amount of research when I was starting to think in terms of, okay, what can I do to uh, you know create an actual viable writing career? I realized that if I wrote my next series under the, the name Anne Elizabeth Stengel, the first people who were going to buy whatever it was were going to be people who loved Goldstone Wood. And that was going to trigger those algorithms in Amazon of, oh, okay, the people who like this new product are people who like Christian fantasy. The problem with that is that Christian fantasy is a very, very small niche. Mm -hmm. There, There is a passionate reader base for Christian fantasy, but it's not a large reader base. So all of a sudden, I would be kind of boxing myself in um, with those algorithms of, okay, this this is her audience, and her audience doesn't really go beyond this. And uh, so on a very, very practical level, I realized, no, I can't actually do that, at least not to start with, not not in the first year of, of publishing, at least. I need to be certain that uh, the readers that I target and the algorithms that I trigger are broader than Christian fantasy. Not because I don't care about those Christian fantasy readers, I do, but I care about a whole different range of readers as well. I I want to be able to capture those those eager buyers that um, actually would provide me with a a viable income and a viable career. Uh, So that was honestly on a very practical level. That's why I decided, okay, I need to leave my name behind. I need to leave that world behind. I truly do need to start from scratch so that I can, you know, establish myself firmly as a YA fantasy novelist, not a Christian YA fantasy novelist, Uh, with the intention always being that down the road, once I have that firm footing, once I have that new audience established, um, I'll, I'll start letting people know, you know, what, what my new name is. Um, but as a result, also, my, my current fantasies are not as overtly Christian as, um, as the original Goldstone Woods. Uh, they, they are aimed at a, more, uh, at a more secular general audience. There are still allegorical threads. There are still Christian themes. Um, but it's, it's not overtly Christian fantasy anymore. Mm-hmm. So you, you take upon the name Sylvia Mercedes, yeah. Um, how did you come up with that name, and how is how is Sylvia Mercedes different from Anne Elizabeth Stengel? Well, Sylvia Mercedes is my great grandmother, and uh, apparently I am a lot like her, except she was a blonde and I'm a brunette. But other than that, <laughs> we're very very similar people. Um, I I met her only once when I was very very small, and uh, the few things I know about her, I'm like, yeah, okay. I, I feel like I might be living on a little bit of a Sylvia legacy. 
Um, I thought her name was cool. Apparently she hated her name, but I thought, oh, that's a cool writer sounding mm-hmm. name. Um, so yeah, I decided to, to claim her name for mine. And, uh, yeah, Sylvia is, she's a slightly different persona from Anne Elizabeth Stengel. I actually tend to refer to her in the third person. I mean, you can hear me doing it now. I refer mm-hmm. to Sylvia as her, not as me. Mm-hmm. Um, so she is, honestly, she's a lot more of a business mind than I am. Um, she, she goes about her business in a much more practical, uh, much more what's going to be the, the, the next, uh, smart move for growing my business, growing my audience, um, and, uh, and growing my skill set, but growing my skill set, um, not just in the writing, but also in writing things that people will enjoy and people and, and will sell. Um, after having experience of, you know, five years of pouring so much heart and soul into passion products, um, Sylvia is a lot more interested in pouring her heart and soul into things that are going to actually work. That's not to say the art is lacking. Um, I actually think that my current work is superior as far as the um, – just storytelling narratives and control of what I'm actually trying to create. Uh, But it is ultimately a lot more practical, a lot less, uh, a lot less passionate in, in a certain, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And the series that Sylvia is writing is the Venetrix Chronicles. And you you sent me over the book one in the series yesterday, Mm -hmm. and I I managed to write about, to read about 20% of it. Um, okay. on a car ride. Uh, so, so I've, I've, I've dipped my toe into the waters of this world and I am very thoroughly enjoying it. Uh, if I get some time later today, I hope to finish it. Uh, I don't know if that will happen. Uh, but we're going to try. <laughs> uh, it's, and it, it, it's book one, uh, but you have, mm-hmm. I think seven books already. Uh, in this and seven, series. book seven is coming out this month. Okay, all right. So but that's something we're going to talk about. Uh, but before we get there to book seven, and this is hard to do for a seven book fantasy series, <laughs> uh, can you give me an elevator pitch? It can be a tall building. That's fine. Uh, tell me okay. what this series is all about. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, deep breath. Here goes. So this series is about. A, um, a young woman who, from the time she was uh, a child, she was dedicated to a holy order uh, whose purpose in the world is to um, eradicate these uh, deadly beings known as shades. Now, shades are disembodied spirits that cannot exist in the physical world unless they possess physical bodies. And... Um, this holy order, the Venators and Venetrices, are they are devoted to ridding the world of shades and preventing these possessions from taking place. Um, but the catch being that in order to actually battle shades, in order to actually uh, have a chance against them, uh, they themselves take shades into their bodies and learn to control them. Uh, for the most part, shades are so much more powerful than their physical hosts that they dominate those hosts and um, and begin to exhibit uh, unnatural powers. But the Order of Saint Evander, um, they have learned methods of you know controlling and dominating the shades so that they can channel the powers very carefully. Um, the, with the belief being that uh, those who are possessed by shades at the point of death uh, will be damned eternally. So for the sake of rescuing souls, they need to kill those shade possessed separate the shade from the the uh the human soul uh and therefore save them uh for for eternity. Uh so it's a dark it's a dark storyline. Mm-hmm. Um so my heroine is uh she's devoted to this holy order um but she has got a unique relationship with her shade. Um that she does not believe that this this being that shares her body is necessarily evil though she has been brought up to believe that all shades are without without exception um totally evil so she is beginning to question uh the truth of this this belief uh, while simultaneously trying to live an upright noble life according to the precepts of her order uh and uh the seven book series takes her on a uh, quite a fantastic journey of um discovery of herself uh her goddess um her her order and um, the truth of her secret past. Uh, I guess that's the elevator pitch for you. Okay. 
Well, it sounds interesting. Like I said, I'm 20% into book one, so I have quite the ways left to mm. go. Uh, but I, I'm committed to the task. I'm going to get there. Okay. Uh, Good so for you. I, I don't know. Uh, it's seven <laughs> books long, but they're none of them that long of books. Each book is about half the length of a Goldstone Wood book. So mm. it, it's not too intimidating, I promise. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of people who listen to this podcast who are authors or they want to be authors, they're indie authors. Um, talk to me about the differences between traditional and indie publishing. What are the pros and the cons of each? Okay. Um, well, with the understanding that um, I'm really only talking from my own experience mm-hmm. and um, other other traditional authors and other indie authors will have different experiences. Um, so traditional publishing is really fantastic in that you focus almost entirely on the writing. Uh, that that is that is your job. Your job is to create the stories and then turn them over to uh, professionals who you know they they will deal with the cover design, the marketing, the formatting, the distribution, all of those all of those much more business hat uh, sides of the of the business. And uh, you get to concentrate almost entirely on the the actual creativity which is fantastic and i do actually kind of miss that i won't lie um indie publishing however uh you do have to wear all the hats you you not only create the product you also have to figure out how to distribute the product how to package the product how to promote the product how to find those readers for your product um it's it's a lot and uh it's a, it's a lot of hats to wear a lot of balls to juggle um that being said uh I feel the great pro of indie publishing is that you do have that control. Um, and I don't in any way want to um, badmouth my, my publishing house, but uh, we, we did often struggle with finding the audience uh, for, my, for my fantasy novels when I was working with Bethany House. Uh, Bethany House is absolutely phenomenal with historical romance, contemporary romance, suspense. Um, they have their genres. Uh, fantasy is a much harder fit for them, and especially at the time when they were picking up and publishing my work, uh, they had not established much of a fantasy audience yet. So um, a lot of the advertising that they that they tried and a lot of their budget went into things that honestly didn't relate to my audience particularly. So it became very difficult um, to, to find my, my readers. I remember the very first conversation I had with them in-house before the first book had even come out I was working part-time at a Barnes & Noble at that time, and I told them it's very important to me that uh, my novels be shelved in the young adult fantasy section so that readers of young adult fantasy can find it when they go shopping for books. And they told me, we can't do that. And sure enough, my book came out, and everywhere I went, it, it shelved with the Amish romances. And that it was a Christian book, so it went to the Christian fiction section. Mm-hmm. And it's very, very difficult for readers of my genre of YA fantasy to find something they love if it's hidden among things that they're just not interested in. Right. Um, so whereas with indie fantasy, I can actually make much more of those concrete decisions of this is my audience, this is where they are, this is where they're looking for books, I'm putting my book there so that they can find it. Um, so I get to make those decisions. Um I spent a lot of time while still traditionally published uh, researching and trying to figure out um, new marketing methods for my work. Um, and Bethany House was very gracious and anything I presented to them, they, they were willing to pay for and to try. But the reality is I was doing most of the research and work to figure out how to write, you know, how to market and promote my books anyway. So making the switch to indie where I'm doing that again, it wasn't really that big of a deal for me because, I really was already doing that with a traditional house anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I much prefer indie publishing. I, I I like knowing that I can make those decisions and that I can actually um, turn on a dime if I need to. Like if something I'm starting to work on just isn't working, I can make I can make a change and I can go a different direction. I'm actually doing that right now. I've got um, a series in the works and. I'm working on cover designs and I'm starting to question if, okay, do these covers really look like something that's going to sell in the market? And I may be making a dramatic change there, but I get to make that call. I get to decide, is this actually what the market right now is looking for? And 
If not, let's make a change. Mm -hmm. So, but the cons obviously of indie publishing being that that responsibility is entirely on you. You do have to turn yourself into an expert in things that are not directly related to the actual writing. You don't get to spend all of your day just creating the new material. Um, So these days I have to split my life pretty evenly. Well, my work life, I also have children. (laughs) So my work life is split between, um, you know, marketing, promotion, packaging, and the actual writing. Uh, And that can be quite a balance sometimes. And sometimes I definitely miss my my traditional publishing days where it was just, oh, I'm working today. I get to sit down and write however many words that I want. (laughs) Right. Yeah. It's, I, I feel like the, the whole industry, of course, has shifted in in t- the past ten years as well. And indie publishing has become a more respected venue, uh, mm. a more respected option for established authors, and not just like, okay, well, you couldn't get traditionally published, so yeah, this is exactly. you know this this is what you have to do. Because uh, I recall it's, it's actually the the first ever uh, podcast episode uh, that I did, I think in two thousand and nine, was with Jerry Jenkins. And uh, mm-hmm. I was asking his advice um, on writing, and he was very anti indie publishing. And I think oh, he's, yeah. he he has changed uh, uh, that thought in the time since. Not necessarily, I think, because his ideas have changed, but because the mm-hmm. the indie publishing industry itself has changed, and it has become uh, both easier to get writing out, but also people have figured out how to do it well. And have, mm. fi- have figured out how to to um, take what was just the domain of, of the traditional publisher, and to be able to do that as a, as an individual person. And I think that you've done that well. You you've shown yourself, okay, you know, I can be established over here, um, and now I, now I'm going to go out and and kind of do it myself and have this creative control. And it, I think it works specifically. I think it works very well in the fantasy realm. Uh, I see a lot of, of indie authors who are having a lot of success uh, in, in in the fantasy genre, uh, in particular for for that. Uh, one of the things that I have in, admired about your writing, and I again I can only really speak of Tales of Goldstone Wood, but I, I get the idea that I'm going to get the same thing in the Venetux Chronicles. Is just your ability to world build. Um, mm-hmm. For 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 Goldstone Wood in particular, uh, and it's it's been a while, so you can correct me on any any details that I'm not correct on. Uh, but the first three books were almost set in the same time frame, mm-hmm. but told somewhat overlapping stories. Uh, and then the next set of books kind of went back, so you, you could almost. Each book was a standalone. You're just kind of being dropped into this fully realized universe that you've already built this world around. What process did you use to to set this world so that you knew that oh, wherever I wherever my entry point is, I have an entire story here that I can tell. Um, gosh, it's actually been so long since I wrote those books too. So my memory is actually a little foggy <laughs> on uh, on all the methods I use. Um, I will say, um, if memory serves, and then as far as like what I'm currently doing as well, um, I really do try to make I try to make the world go with the characters. Mm-hmm. So the characters really do come first, and the the elements of the world building that I bring in are the elements that I believe are going to best serve to 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 show those characters in the, in the most interesting different angles and from as many different interesting angles as possible. Um, so there is a decent amount. I mean, there's a lot of under the surface world building that 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 goes on. But as far as like what I bring to the surface and what I actually try to put on the page, I I try to limit that to. What what is going to serve this story with these specific characters? What do we need to know? Um, in recent history, I've honestly cut back even even further on on what elements of the world I actually reveal. I, I read a very interesting article by a very talented uh, novelist whom I admire, Kate Stradling is her name, where she she talked about effective lying in the world of, of fiction writing, and she pointed out that an effective lie is one that doesn't go into too many details. You mm. assume Assume that the that the person to whom you are lying it, that they already know 
And if you give them that kind of an assumption, that kind of a feel, then they're going to just go along with it and not even question you. Whereas a less convincing lie is one where you have to keep embroidering the details. You have mm-hmm. to keep giving them more information. And then the scenes start to show. So I, I found in, in recent history that's been more the method that I take. Like I, I have a whole, you know, stack of ideas in my head of what this world is, but I, I try to hold back on on which things I actually tell because it's more convincing the more you hold back. Um, And in Goldstein Wood, I I was still learning that method. So there's actually a decent amount more like superfluous world building that goes on in those stories, which was fun. I mean, I totally enjoyed indulging myself. Mm -hmm. Um, But for the most part, really it comes back to what do we need to know about the world that's going to serve this character or these characters and the adventure that they're on. I don't know if that answered the question particularly well, but uh. yeah, I, I think it does. I just, I just imagine that, you know, that it's like you have this this world that's built, so it's like behind the scenes, you know, are there? Because I, I have seen some authors that are like, well, yes, I had to write this ten thousand page synopsis so that I would know what this was going to be over here, and of course, you know, like Tolkien wrote entire languages. Oh, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> behind, um, you know, his material, and he wrote material that was just the basis for this material, and um, mm. it, it really... That's, that's definitely not me. <laughs> it, you know, it really helps the, the world come alive, um, and helps, I think, with the consistency and the tone. Uh, of the world to to do that, and you definitely accomplished that with Goldstone, and I, I'm sure you did the, the same with Venetrix. Um, and another question for the writers out there: I, I know that, that we've been kind of long, so I'm going to wrap this up. Um, you you have two young children, and yeah. you you have managed to publish about two novels a year for the past few years. Uh, I have two young children, and I barely have the time to write a book review. Uh, so I just want to ask, what does your writing day look like, and how do you how do you manage to get it all done? Um, well, for, for one thing, it actually hasn't been two books a year uh, since I had my daughter. I had three years with no publication whatsoever. I I was actually stockpiling, so it may look as though I've been doing two a year, but the reality is I've actually put out six books since last August um, okay. because I stockpiled releases. Um, so it's not actually as impressive as all that. <laughs> um, but uh, no, my so pretty. It's so pretty good. It, it's a decent amount of material. Um, and I'm actually working to. I'm I'm very much trying to actually um, expand on that. And uh, my goal at the moment is to try to have um, at least four books a year released. I'm trying to really up my production levels. Um, so since having children, honestly, I, I keep joking to my husband that having children was the best thing for my writing career um, because I have had to learn to be so much more focused and efficient with my time. So one of the first things I did after having my daughter was I I read a book on um, how to increase your daily word count. It was uh, called 5,000 Words an Hour, and it is by the author Chris Fox. And he promotes all of these really interesting methods for training your brain to get into creative flow mode instantly when, when when you sit down to work. And also training your brain to, to, to let that creative flow mode just channel through you in such a way that you can get so many words down on a page in a very short amount of time. And um, so that way you can go in and out of creative flow. Before I had children and before I had to uh, learn how to turn myself on and on, off like that creatively, um, you know, I could sit down and kind of pick at a scene for, you know, half an hour, an hour, two hours, whatever, until I finally kind of went, oh, okay, this is what I want to do with it and start really generating some serious word count. I just don't have that luxury these days. I I really have to get into that creative mindset right away, as soon as I sit down to work. Um, So I am not writing 5,000 words an hour. I am definitely not that writer, but I can write about 2,500 an hour, which is a decent amount of work. And, Mm -hmm. um, and it's 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 quality work. Like this is this is I sit down and I'm I'm on and I'm ready to go, and then you know I've got my daily word count in a very short period of time. So uh, I've actually increased my daily word count as a result of before children I was writing four thousand words a day, inconsistently. Uh, since having my daughter I bumped that up to five thousand words a day, uh, consistently um, every workday. 
Um, these days, I have two children. I just gave birth to my little boy a few months ago. He's three months old now and um, totally swamps life in every possible mm-hmm. way. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Three months old. Um, but uh, my husband and I have worked out a way to allow me to have uh, three dedicated work days uh, a, a week. And I put in 10,000 words on every one of those work days. So uh, I actually have increased my production tremendously. But all of that was learning to uh, exercise my creative brain, learning how to to uh, train my brain to to work in ways that I just didn't have to learn how to do before. I just there wasn't a need for it before children. Um, so these days, when when I have a work day, I'm able to sit down, pour out the words, pour out the story, and then when I'm off, I'm off. You know, I turn I turn it off, and I'm back with my children, and I'm back with my my day to day mom life and. I'm much more focused and peaceful just working with them because I don't feel the stress of will I get the words in? Will I get the books done? Will, you know, when is it going to happen? I know I have X number of hours on these days and that's when the words will happen. So I highly recommend the book by Chris Fox. It, it really was just an absolute revolution for me as a writer. Um, I, I, revelation, I should say. <laughs> revelation for me as a writer. Mm. And uh, I've been recommending it to all my writer friends uh, every chance I get because it, it truly has made a huge, huge difference. Um, and, you know, mom life is fantastic and exhausting, um, but it really has been just so much better. I, I'm so much happier both as a writer and as a person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just finding finding that dedicated time and just really like having a process to be committed to it, I think is, mm-hmm. is the key. Do, do you find that you are when when you write these scenes, do you have in your mind this is what I'm going to write today, or is it all seat of the pants, or or do you plot everything out? I, I'm very I'm very plot driven, so mm-hmm. I I spend a lot of time before I sit down to write. Um, you know, I'll spend at least a week uh, developing a, a very solid outline, so I know exactly what needs to be accomplished. That being said, there's a decent amount of seat of the pants that happens within each of those scenes. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I like to do is I know the end goal of each scene. I know. I know the change that needs to happen within the scene because every scene needs to have a moment of change of some kind in it. That's what draws readers on. That's what keeps them wanting to turn those pages. So I always know what that moment of change is going to be that's going to naturally lead to the next scene. How we get to that moment of change is usually pretty flexible, and that's where the spontaneous creativity comes in. Um, so I, I would never call myself a seat of the pants author. That being said, a decent amount of seat of the pants work, ha- work happens um, when I'm actually in the zone. But no, to write dedicatedly um, a, a decent chunk of words per day for me definitely means having a plan uh, going into it. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll move on to our last question. And uh, you have a book that's coming up, so I want to end with that. Okay. Um, so I. I'm on book one, so don't spoil anything for me. Okay, but, <laughs> okay. But you, you have a book that's coming out. Uh, what do readers need to know about it? Okay, well, so my book coming up is book seven in the Venetrix Chronicles. Uh, this is the first time I have written a series uh, where it is uh, a, the whole series is dedicated to one ultimate story arc. Um, Goldstone Wood was much more episodic, and while there were many arcs between books, in this case, the entire series is building up to this final climactic book seven. So uh, book seven is basically, uh, I, I would describe it as nonstop thrills. It is one payoff after another. We've been building to this point over the six previous books. All of the major characters are poised for massive changes and massive decision making and massive losses. And uh, it's it's pretty breathtaking. Um, it was a breathtaking story to write. It, I it, I felt a lot of just I mean, honestly pure stress while writing it, but it was a delicious kind of stress, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, it's a big culmination, and it was fun for me because I never got to write a big culminating story for Goldstone Wood. Uh, it mm-hmm. was a huge challenge for me to actually bring something to an end, an actual end. Um, it was a completely different challenge for me. But yes, if you have been reading the Venetrix Chronicles, this is this is the big payoff story, and it's it's pretty epic. Um, it's still short, however, it is 
still, all of these are half the length of each of my Goldstone Wood books. So there's a lot of epic packed into a very short amount of words. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after this one, I'll, I'll just do a shout out. Um, in October, I have the beginning of a new series coming out. I have a trilogy of books. Um, it's epic fantasy, but it is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast in a epic romantic fantasy context. Um, so, and it's set in a different world from the Benetrix Chronicles, different magic system, different lore, different background. And um, it stars a, a clever thief, a clever young thief, and a disgraced uh, mage magic user. And uh, so that it will be the next project right after this book seven finishes. I'll be launching directly into the next trilogy. Okay, and, and readers, uh, listeners can find out about those books where? Uh, they can find out on my, my website, which is sylviamercedesbooks.com. They can also uh, look me up on Amazon, look up Sylvia Mercedes. All of my books are listed there, um, including some pre-orders for upcoming projects. Uh, I am on Facebook. Sylvia Mercedes is, is uh, on Facebook, but I am terrible with social media, so I am not there very often, but you can follow me. Um, on my website, I have an uh, option to sign up for a newsletter, and you can get a free novel from me that you cannot get anywhere else. And it is a complete novel. It is a 50,000-word novel, not a short story, um, that I wrote exclusively for newsletter sign- uh, subscribers. Um, and it actually, I, I kind of hate to say this, but it might be my favorite thing that I wrote <laughs> in the Venetrix world. I really love it. I kind of hate giving it away for free, but that's what it exists for. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you if you want to sign up for my newsletter um, to get the novel, you can. And if you don't want to stay subscribed to me, you can unsubscribe at any time and you still get your free novel. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Sylvia, that's what I'll call you because that's who you okay. are in the <laughs> writing world now. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for chronicling, uh, your, <clears throat> your evolution as a writer, um, your old work, uh, for Tales of Goldstone Wood and for your new work, Venetrix Chronicles, and, uh, for both, both careers that you've had thus far in the writing industry. It's been, it's been an entertaining ride and I'm, it was, I, I was glad to be on the roller coaster that was Tales of Goldstone Wood, and I'm excited that I have a new thrill ride to get on now. Uh, so I don't think I don't think that I will make it all the way to to book seven before it releases, but um, I, I won't even tell you that I'll do my best because I have a stack of books about four feet high that I need to mm, yeah. <laughs> that are already on my to read list. But I promise you, at some point, um, we will I, I will get to them. Uh, because awesome. you you've you've earned that uh, as as a writer in, in my in my mind that uh, whatever you write I'm gonna be there I'm gonna be there to read it so again thank you so much for your time uh, congratulations on this second life that you have I wish you the best all the success and sales and um, you know and just whatever whatever comes next and I think at this point we know that it could be who who knows who knows what could come next could be anything. It's true. It's true. Thank you so much, Josh. This really was fantastic.